welcome everybody to the second session of the second day of our uh, workshop Categorical Probability and Statistics. It's my pleasure to introduce the most famous person in the workshop, at least who care everything and uh, who shall um, care of everybody speaker uh, in our meetings, uh, Paolo Perona from NMIT and he can speak about the probability monas. So uh, we talk about a lot and stochastic dominance. So please. Thank you, Van. Thank you, Van. Uh, let me share my screen. Thanks, Van. Thanks to all the organizers. And uh, also thank to our very good support team, tech support team, and thanks to the guy that's putting the videos on YouTube. You guys are doing an amazing job. So I'm going to talk about uh, stochastic dominance. So what is stochastic dominance? So stochastic dominance is basically a consistent way of comparing probability measures. In some coherent way. So um, what's the idea? Suppose, for example, that you want to invest in apples and oranges, okay? So this is how, how much you could gain. And here's the probability. And for example, this is the distribution you would get from apples. Um, okay, I can't really draw an apple. Let me draw a banana. Let's do bananas and oranges. That's the expected gain that you could get by selling bananas, and this is the expected gain that you could get by selling oranges. Now you probably know that it's less risky to maybe not spend all your, not use all your savings in bananas and not all of your savings in oranges. It's better to differentiate. So the idea is that if you instead have like half enough, 50-50, that could be the curve. So if these are Gaussians, uh, you know that summing then gives you just a, a square root of two uh, as much uh, standard deviation. But of course, we're dividing by two here. It's a convex combination. So we, we actually have something that's more peaked, less random of a factor of square root of two, okay? So now, given these curves, how would you like to invest? You may want to... Um, you may want to say that, well, oranges on, on the average will give you much money, uh, more money. Or maybe you may want to say though that, yeah, that's true, but if, you, if it's a bad year for oranges, you lose very big. 50-50 is safer. Of course, you don't win very big, you also don't lose very big, right? So in some sense, the white distribution is safer than the orange one. And you may prefer that one. Maybe you want to do some planning, you have some strategies. And so it, it's better if your outcomes are less random so that your, your strategy can be better, all right? So whether this distribution and this distribution is better, it kind of depends, of course, on the agent. What, do we, what we should all agree on though, is that For sure, the white curve is better than the yellow curve. So for any agent, for any observer, if you want, that is, of course, prone to gain more money and is risk averse, everybody should agree that the white distribution is better than the yellow distribution, okay? So that's like standard in like uh, mathematical finance and economics decision theory, that's a standard concept. Now, the question is how do we talk about this? Um, using monads. Okay, well, using, of course, probability monads. If you don't know what a probability monad is, there is a beautiful tutorial that explains very, very well how this works. Uh, it's in the same playlist as uh, the videos, okay? All right, so 
maybe before jumping to the usage of monads, let's first explain the fundamental difference between probability measures and random variables. Because sometimes the things are used interchangeably. Of course, they're not the same, but they're also not really one-to-one. -one. So here's, what's, here's what the main problem is. Um, so let's see. Random variables versus probability measures. So well, let's work for now in the category of measurable spaces that has the Giri monad. So what is a random variable? Now, first of all, we take a measurable space, so X equipped with the sigma algebra F, and we also take a measure mu. So if you want mu is in PX using the Giri monad notation. A random variable consists of, well, okay, let me maybe call this uh, to be more consistent. Let me call this omega. So that's our probability space. And a random variable is a measurable map from omega to some space X, again, measurable. So let me drop the sigma algebra for the moment. Okay, so that's a random variable. And of course we can obtain a probability measure by just well, you apply the jury monad to this. So PF, which is F star. And you have the measure mu. So this will be mapped to F star mu. That's the distribution or the law of your random variable. Now you see, it's easy to obtain the probability measure from the random variable. The other way around is not the same. But where do we see that they're not really the same? Where do we see that we're losing some information? Because if you only have one, there's not much of a difference. The real difference comes in if you have two of these. So if you have two random variables, okay? Because of course, uh, maybe let me put this up here. Of course, we can again do the same and get, well, G star mu and obtain two probability measures. But we can do also more. So if you want by the universal property of the product, we can also form, so these two maps here are the same as a map here, usually denoted by the pairing, and so you can also find a join random variable that tells you kind of how these oh, two no. random variables are correlated. Can something that... ask, may I interrupt you? Sure, go ahead. Yeah, so you say random variable because it's actually that's a kind of also um, philosophy question, and uh, I also discussed in our uh, we discuss our paper and see many people. But uh, we have to be very precise. Random variable, where? Yes, because uh, in statistics usually when you consider, of course, uh, you right here, that's a, they consider that's a random variable. On X and omega is a some uh, universal yeah, generator of the random variable. Of course, you can consider. Uh, so that's a different thing. Or if, if you completely forget about the kind of the abstract generator of random variables, then you have probability measure. So that's, I, I ask you, random variable taking value in X, right? Yeah, so yeah, some people would call this a random element in general. Of course, nothing prevents yeah. this from being an actual number. So X could be real numbers. But for the discussion, at least so far, X could be any, any measurable set. And okay. omega is abstracting or uh, universal space or... Yeah. So uh, it's, as a measurable space, it's convenient to take omega to be like the unit interval with its usual Borel sigma algebra or some kind yeah. of like standard Borel space that's large enough. Yes. Okay. In, in practice, but of course uh, for, so, so far we're doing basically just diagrams. So the same thing applies to any other short choice. I don't know if this answers your question, uh, does it? No, no, uh, I mean, that's a kind of, uh, usually uh, uh, 
the thing is, I have to say, I uh, statistician writing and they think that they know what uh, they are talking about. Therefore, they writing not very precise. Mm. And then that's the random variable. You say that's a random variable is uh, on X, taking value on X. Because uh, as I said, some people try to be more precise. That random variable is a measurement mapping from omega to X. Yeah? So that's a, that is a, a completely definition precisely what mean, yeah? Yes, yes, yes. So the, that's the, 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 the uh, mathematically rigorous. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what I wanted to say is that, uh, well, we don't need this anymore. Let me uh, do some drawing. Uh, so if this is X, so let's say this is omega. And it comes with some kind of measure on it. Okay. We have X. With the map F, we have G with, with the map Y. And we can push forward this distribution. We get uh, some kind of measure on X and some kind of measure on Y. But we also know precisely which point of omega has gone where. This point of omega goes here and, and here. So this unit of mass that here corresponds to this unit of mass, here correspond to this unit of mass. We know which mass here correspond to which mass here, okay? That's something that you, an information that you do not have if you just look at the probability measures. That's extra information. Or using the same uh, diagram as before, we can form also x times y. Of course, it could project here if we want. And so the idea is that we also, so let's suppose that X and Y are the same space. So we even have the diagonal where they completely coincide. There could be many join measures up here, but here it gives you the join. So what could happen is that here we have uh, some kind of independence, right? So we're, uh, if these are Gaussians, this could be, for example, a bivariate Gaussian. That's just the product of these two. But there's many other options. So maybe instead of a Gaussian, we could have a measure that's like perfectly correlated and supported on the diagonal. So that would tell you that this unit of measure and this unit of measure correspond to this unit of measure. Okay. So you can view this joint as some kind of transport plan or correlation plans that tells you, okay, this point of Y correspond to which point of X? Well, the measure tells you in this case, this point of X. In general, if we have a more general measure that has some more randomness, this point of Y, so the mass at this point of Y will be spread along other points of the space X, not just necessarily one point. So the joint tells you the correlation. And if you have random variables, you also have all of these. Okay, so it, in this sense, it gives you more information. Okay, so um, of course, people that are familiar with probability theory know this, but this may not be obvious to people that are less familiar. So now, is this clear? Are there any questions about this? So go ahead. <clears throat> Very good. All right, so given this, keep this in mind we're now going to talk about first order stochastic dominoes. Sorry. So first order stochastic dominance tries to answer the question, how much do we gain? But of course, to the, to the random sense. So the idea is like, how much, but randomly. So in other words, we have a set equipped with a partial order. So again, I'm dropping the sigma algebra. And we want to get an order on Px, okay? 
So this is done in many ways. Uh, the first time no, no, I saw no, this. Me. So me is that that you want to make the uh, process structure on space a probability measure, right? Yes. So maybe let's give a drawing. Uh, let me put real numbers with their usual order and let me put them diagonally so I can still draw yes. measures on them. We would like to say that this measure that, that would have like this density is mm -hmm. lower yeah, okay. than this measure. And that it must be agree is the process structure on the, the uh, major space X. Uh, what, what, because you say that the X has some uh, process structure, right? Yeah, so it has to be compatible in some way. Of course, yeah, so th this, the, the fact that the orange measure is somehow higher up than the yellow measure has to do with the fact that R is ordered the way it is. Right? That, that's how our, our interpretation goes. So uh, let's first talk about random variables. So for random variables, it's actually relatively easy to say uh, what happens. So let's take two random variables. So we have F and G to our space X. And now we would like to say, we say that F is less or equal than G. Mu almost surely or sometimes we say uh, yes. So I remember the mu is the measure on omega. It lives in here, okay? If, well, the set, so the subset of omega such that f of omega is less or equal than g of omega is contained, uh, sorry, contains a measurable set of measure uh, of probability one, let's say, of full measure. If this set is itself measurable, then that's basically saying that this thing has probability one. Or equivalently, I mean, remember that we have our joint distribution, uh, x here. Mm -hmm. So we have this measure fg star, the joint that we get in here, okay? And the joint that we get in here has a very particular structure. So if this is x times x, this is the diagonal. So let me be easy to call this like that's the points in the form x x. This part are the points in the form x, y, where x is less or equal than y. Okay, so I've drawn this as a, as a total order, but it could be a partial order. So this not necessarily some kind of half space, but still they have the points that are, so this is the order relation as a subset of the Cartesian product, okay? Let me denote this set by this. This is equivalent to say that the push forward of our measure mu will all be inside this set, okay? Or in other words, all the mass, so this has like these marginals on P and on Q. Basically to move the mass from the law of the first random variable to the second random variable, we can do that always along the arrows of the order. So maybe let's put this here. We can move the mass. Move the mass from f star mu to g star mu along the arrows of the order. In other words, our like transfer plan, our, our correspondence plan tells us that any unit of mass that you put here, so take this part of the yellow distribution, to put it 
in you can like go along the order go up in the order or stay where you are and you can move all the mass of the first measure to the mass of the second measure all always following the order so all the mass goes up okay so is this clear yes but what is the motivation um, so the, here is how to say that the random variable f is less than the random variable of g. So if these, if these were just deterministic elements of s, x, sorry, then you just compare them using the order of x. How do you do this for random variables? So a natural way is doing as we have done. So in this sense, this random variable is less than this random variable. Yes. Okay? Like, yes. So it's... Um, in terms of probability measures, of course, there could be many possible joints, okay? So we quantify, question. there's um, a question. Yeah, um, you said that you defined uh, one random variable being less than or equal to another one is almost surely being less, but in that yeah. picture, they seem to overlap. So there is some probability, some non-zero probability that yellow would not be less than orange, right? Uh, so this is a very good remark. Uh, Thanks for asking this, so be careful. We don't have just the probability measures, we have the random variables so far, okay? So if, if the join, which we have, it's determined, if the join is all here, up here in the order, this means in particular that this yellow part is not going down. This, this part will go up here and, and the corresponding part on the, on the orange measure will, was probably coming from something down here. Okay. So. So you're comparing quantiles. Uh, no, Is that basically no, no what you're doing. A quantile meaning the the point on the distribution for each of the uh, random variables. Well, not quite. Uh, but the idea is that maybe let's use it in terms of points of omega. So uh, for every point of omega, that's so to say in the support of a mu, so we don't have supports here. It's not, uh, it's not a topological space yet. We'll have it later. For all the points that are relevant for the measures, then where F will map the point is below where G will map the point. Okay. So the, the, the joint probability measure, which is telling how to move the mass of, of the first measure to get to, to the mass of the second measure is moving the mass always along the arrows of the order, okay? And th there could still be overlap between the probability measures, okay? But it's, the joint is saying that this measure is not, that the mass is not going down or in an incomparable direction of the partial rule. I see, the, the, they're not independent. They're not in this case, no. So you see, if they were independent, then we, we would of course uh, have something also here, right? In general. I mean, if not in the general case, if they're direct deltas, uh, of course not, but. Uh, in, in, they're, they're in, in general, not independent, they come with a joint that's given just by the fact that we have random variables, so they could have correlation themselves or any kind of interaction. And this moving intuition that you're describing is when omega, both omega and x are r in that no. picture you drew? No, omega can be anything. We're but, just using the measurable structure of omega, so it could be literally anything. X needs to be an order. So we are, I'm, I'm using r because it's, uh, it's easy to draw, but this could have been a partial order, as long as there's an order. So I have a set, equipped with some arrows, Okay, so maybe, maybe let's give an example actually with a partial order. So let me go here. Let's again use like a bananas and oranges, but not in the same way as before, okay? So we have a set that has four elements. We have nothing, we have a banana, we have an orange, and we have a situation where we could have a banana and an orange, okay? Now, of course, a banana is better than nothing, and an orange is also better than nothing, and both are better than everything. But some people prefer bananas, some people prefer, prefer oranges, okay? So this is just a partial order. Now, what I want to say 
is that maybe a distribution that's a Dirac delta, let's say on a banana, this is less than a distribution that's like half on the banana and half on both. Why? Because you can cut this mass and lift this part here and put this one up along the order. Okay. But let's now talk about probability measures. So let now P and Q be probability measures on PX. So definition, we say that P is less or equal than Q in the stochastic order or in equivalently in first order stochastic dominance if equivalently Either they are laws of random variables f and g with f less or equal than g almost surely, mm -hmm. or equivalently, they admit a joint. which assigns full measure mm -hmm. to the order. What is that word? Is there laws of random variables? Laws of random variables, uh, laws or distributions. Okay. Namely, so remember you have this and you take F star of mu, where mu is the measure on this probability space omega. Okay. So now we don't know, when we have just probability measures, of course, this is less than heavy random variables. We don't, we don't have a canonical joint. So we're saying that P is less than Q if there exists such a joint, if there is a way of mapping the mass of the white distribution to the mass of the yellow distribution which never leaves the order. So in such a way that the mass always goes up. All right. It's nice to talk about support. Uh, so let's go to a uh, topological case. Uh, there's two ways, two nice ways that I'm aware of to work and do that. Uh, so the first one is uh, for compact Hauser spaces. So compact Hauser spaces with a closed partial order. And we want our morphisms to be continuous monotone maps. And another version, uh, which is the one I've, I've worked on myself, is complete metric spaces. So uh, with the condition, uh, which I'll tell you in a second, and one Lipschitz or short, monotone maps. So plus a condition that we say, so the, or, uh, the order such that X is less or equal to Y if and only if for every F from X to R, so morphism of your category, monotone Lipschitz, 
f of x is necessarily equal to g of x. So of course the implication to the right is obvious because we want f to be monotone. The one to the left is less obvious. There are some counterexamples. Uh, so we want to say that the order is not just closed, it behaves, behaves nicely with respect to the metric. That's uh, a technical condition, okay? What is G? Oh, sorry, of course, I mean F uh, of Y. <laughs> sorry, of course, uh, thanks. Um, all right, so here we have very nice notions of duality. So for the nice case, uh, so let P and Q be in PX, okay? So in the first case, an X is a compact house or space with a closed partial order. Then we have the P is less or equal than Q in the stochastic order. If and only if, for every continuous monotone map, so morphism of our category, x to r, the integral of f in dp is less or equal than the integral of f in dp. The second is similar. Well, let me just copy actually. I missed an integral where here we say instead of continuous one Lipschitz or short. So what's the interpretation? So let me recall this apples and oranges example from before. Uh, let me redraw them. So if we have, we could have nothing. We could have a, a banana. We could have an orange and we could have a banana and an orange, okay? Now, some people prefer bananas, some people prefer oranges, but suppose that we want to put a price on these items, which is a map into R. So we could have like a white map that puts, well, let's say this to zero, this to some maximum value. And if maybe, I don't know, maybe our customers prefers oranges to bananas. So the banana goes here and the orange goes here, okay? This is a price that's consistent with our partial order. But there may be some other customer preserves, pre prefers bananas. And so they will map maybe the banana up here and the orange down here, okay? That's another price that's consistent with our order. Still, both cost more. All right. Now I want to say that for any choice, so for any consistent choice of price, for any consistent choice of price, P is cheaper. Thank you. Okay. So you see, uh, there's, recall the, the distribution of before. You see here, the yellow distribution is more expensive than the white distribution, regardless of the, the relative prices of uh, oranges and bananas, right? Because this, you have like with probability one half, you have both things, which is for sure more. All right, uh, sorry once again here. So this is telling you that the stochastic order can be also tested using functions in some form of uh, duality, all right? Okay, is this clear? Are there questions about this? I have a small question. So um, just to make, to, I guess, just to help clarify, if you were working with finite sets, then it's yeah. equivalent to saying that these two measures when evaluated on number, like on any element, um, one is always greater than the other, correct? 
no, not quite. These measures give higher mass to higher numbers and lower mass to lower numbers. So you see that, let's go back here. You see, uh, here we have a discrete set, like it has four points. I see, this is because you're working with monotone maps, correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you see the banana has more white mass than, than yellow mass. Okay. Okay, any more questions? So that would be interesting when you make the motivation for such a uh, stochastic dominance. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the thing is, how can we, so remember the first slide, um, how can we say that, the, for example, the orange is better than the banana in this curve? So now, now it's a different example using fruit. It's not as before. Uh, you see, in first order stochastic dominance, one now could say that uh, investing in oranges is better than investing in bananas. Okay? We have somehow figured out this arrow. Okay, so what I want to see now is that uh, this gives a, us nice monads. So probability monads on these order sets. Mm -hmm. And if you want, some of you may know that partial orders are a special case of categories. So these are these categories that I put up here are actually two categories under pointwise order. So we get actually two monads or like order enriched at least uh, monads on these order sets. Okay. So the first one that was like a compact house or that's called the random monad. And the second one that's on complete metric spaces That's called the ordered Kantorovich monad. Uh, Paolo, so, uh, so uh, as I, is, uh, I understand that uh, uh, from the beginning, I thought that you think that uh, once you have the order structure on the X, you have got the order structures on PX. Of course, that also something nice, theorem. But now you say about the two monads, and I got uh, lost. Uh, what is the two monads? So that's just like a monad, basically, except that it's the categories may have extra structures. So you usually have like objects and morphisms, mm -hmm. right? But here yes. we also have a way of saying that F is less or equal than G. So it's just like there's a two, there's a map between arrows, yes. which well, is like for us, it's just an inequality. Yes. Uh, and I like want to say that like. the monad itself is monotone. So if you apply P to everything. Yes then this arrow here will remain. Something like P is monotone. Yeah. So it's functorial on the two cells. Yes. So the, uh, a fancy way of saying this is saying that this yeah. is a two monad. Yeah, check uh, okay. language. So uh, maybe in the language of the tutorial, remember that we were saying monads, like probability monads, are a way of going from deterministic To random, right? We were going from deterministic elements to random yes. elements, from operation between deterministic elements to operation between random elements and so on. Here we are making the order random, okay? We had an order on X. Okay. Now here we got an order of PX, which is perfectly consistent. And in particular, the unit of the monad, mm -hmm. uh, I call this delta actually, is an order embedding. So the, if, you, if you restrict to the Dirac deltas, then you recover the original order. All right. Um, some of you may know uh, that these monads may have algebras. So the algebras should be some kind of convex spaces, basically where you can form convex combinations. So for the first monad you get well, compact, convex subset of locally convex 
topological vector spaces and the order is given by a closed positive con and for the second one well you get almost the same thing so i'm lazy let me copy and paste except that instead of locally convex topological vector spaces you get well again a locally convex topological vector space but with the metric okay all right any questions about this Uh, she, she want to see some kind of uh, application relation to something we know uh, it can so apply. uh this has been done in the context of computer science too for example uh i'm not going to talk about this but uh, a similar construction to this one is the so-called probabilistic power domain and the category of like uh, for example dcpos and again, there you get the stochastic order. And if you have an order, for example, of increasing precision of a certain construction, then sometimes you may want to run a prob probabilistic programs on that. And you have like random outcomes. And how do you say that this uh, probability measure better approximates uh, your result than some other probability measure? Then you have to extend this order to the random case. I'm not a I'm not a theoretical computer scientist, so I don't know exactly like uh, the details of this construction. But that's an example of application. Or another one, of course, like uh, to motivate the order is that because suppose you want to again uh, decide if you want to invest in apples or oranges. Here, of course, the picture is enough. Well, oranges are better, but of course, things don't always look so nice. So if you want a way to compose uh, to compare probability measures in general. That's the way, okay? But now, so far, we were just comparing like, you know, the yellow distribution with the orange distribution and not uh, talking about how random things are or how risky things are. So let's talk about how risky things are. Let's try to see why the white one is in some sense better. And that's what's called second order stochastic dominance. We have only five minutes more, right? Yeah, I know. I, I hope I can take a, a little bit more since I had live questions. Okay. So. Because you have this discuss during the talk. Yes, please. Okay. So second order success dominance is how random things are. How random on the same data. So this is your SpaceX. We have a bunch of measures. So maybe we have this yellow measure. We have this orange measure and we want to say that the, the yellow measure is more random than the red measure. But maybe we also have, a, I don't know, a white measure. And we don't want to say that the white measure is less random than the yellow measure because they are over different data. Or maybe if you're like, on a two dimensional space, maybe the yellow measure, the white measure is like this, and the yellow measure is like this over a different direction. So the randomness goes in a different direction. Okay? So we're not just computing something like the variance or the entropy or something. We're even, it's, we want the partial order to compare them like given the data, so to say. All right? So it turns out that the way to do this for random variables is the so called conditional expectation. So we have again random variables. So where omega is omega with a sigma algebra and, and a measure. So we say that G is a conditional expectation of F if there is a sub sigma algebra G of F mm -hmm. such that G, uh, G is also measurable for the sub sigma algebra 
And for every set G of the sigma algebra, the integral of F. So here we need an algebra actually. We need to be talking about, uh, let's say R or any P algebras. So uh, for example, these locally convex topological vector surfaces. And the integral of f mm -hmm. d mu over g is the same as the same for g. So this could be rather technical for the people who don't uh, who don't know uh, measure theory. So let's use partitions instead. It's a finite equivalent. So the partitions are the finite equivalent. of sigma algebra. So let me maybe give you an example from real life. Uh, so because conditional expectations are all over the place, politics, economics, all over the place. I chose an example from real life that hopefully does not upset anybody. Some topics are very sensitive. So here is, come on, open this. Here is a map of the United States with the election, the presidential elections of 2016, divided by counties. So there's a very fine partition of the United States into counties, okay? And in there, you have a, a function, this map from counties to either red or blue or anything in between, so a convex space, an algebra, that tells you like uh, blue is uh, Democrats, red is Republicans, and anything in between is the proportion in that, okay? So this function is measurable for the sigma algebra of counties, which means that within each cell of the partition, it's constant. Now one could take a coarser sigma algebra, so states, and replace this very fine function with local averages in the state, okay? Now, the, the thing is, in, within each state, which in each big cell, the relative ratios of red and blue are going to be the same, okay? So it's like a local average, all right? But of course, uh, but of course the new function is now constant on larger partitions, all right? Now, I want to argue that that's exactly how you get more concentrated probability measures on the same data. So thankfully, this program, which is beautiful, allows us to take histograms of the colors, okay? So here are, here is the histogram of the distribution of colors that you get in this fine case, all right? Uh, this has some bins, so you have a lot of large delta, so it's not uh, the entire distribution and there are some bins. But if instead now we take the coarser one, you see that the distribution is more concentrated, but it's going to say the same expected values, right? So what's the reason? The thing is, for example, take it for California, all right? In California, there are some regions that are very blue. And that's why here in the, in the histogram, you get this something on like a, that, that's like very on the blue side. But of course, then once you average over the state, then the rest of California is going to be less blue. And so we don't have something so far in the blue direction anymore. The bluest thing is this column, okay? And of course, we also have less columns because, well, there's just less colors here. So the push forward measure will be supported on less things because there are less scholars, all right? So that's conditional expectations. And uh, let me maybe conclude now since I'm uh, going over time with saying uh, what we can do for probability measures. So let P and Q be in PX. So I've done this for case two for the Kantorovich monad. So X as a uh, complete metric spaces and so on. Then P is 
Uh, let's see. The following are equivalent. First, there are random variables with, of course, f star mu is p and g star mu of q, is q, where g is a conditional expectation of p, of uh, f, to, um, so g is more concentrated, so there exist r in, of course, this has to be an algebra, sorry about that. Uh, in P, P A such that now P A to A is the structure map of the algebra. Let me call it E and it's an integration. We can go either apply mu, the multiplication of the monad. So maybe we denoted it by E in the tutorial or by, and here we can apply PE. So such that now ER is P and PE of R is Q. So if this is A, some kind of convex space. Uh, so a probability measure over probability measures is very hard to draw. So let me draw a discrete probability measure over continuous probability measure. So we take this continuous probability measure and this continuous probability measure with one half of that plus one half of the other one, okay? So what we can do is either average them, so really take one half and one half, so 50-50 of those, or applying PE means for each term here, you take the expected value. So you take a delta here and a delta here. And you see that the measure on the left is, sorry, here there's PA the measure on the left is more spread than the measure on the right, okay? It, this is a bit like what was happening with the, the counties and the states in, in the mapping. The duality theory for this tells us that uh, for every map, which is now not monotone, but Con, uh, convex or concave now, uh, let's say convex, okay. So a convex map is a map like this, a map that scores more on the outside than the integral of f in dp. is larger than the integral of f dp. So maybe it's better to reverse the arrow and here put a concave map. This would look like this, okay? So in, in economics, you know that you, if your like a utility functions are concave, then they are risk averse. So they prefer stuff that's more concentrated than stuff that's more spread. So again, here we have a duality, uh, a duality property using maps. We can express this again using two monads, so these are the same as the oplax morphisms of algebras, but uh, I don't have time to expand on this because this involves a little bit of two category theory and uh, it's gonna take too long, okay? So I'm gonna finish here, let me recap. Uh, so ref references, For one, that's the paper of Klaus Kaimel. So the monad of probability measures um, over compact ordered spaces 
2008, and a reference for the Kantorovich case, including this one with second order stochastic dominance, is probably my thesis. So you can find it at this address. Okay, um, I'm already a bit over time, so let me stop here. Thank yeah, so it's the, let us thank the speaker. So uh, it still has a five minutes, but I think that's, um, we can discuss, there are a lot of things very interesting. Actually, I already have the um, copy of the, your PhD thesis, but I have not yet checked that part of second order. Uh, stochastic dominance, so, uh, so then uh, we have only five minutes, so let's like make a little bit break to be fresh for the next uh, talk. Sure. And uh, if you have questions, we shall discuss in the Zulip ch right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so okay. much. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you for a very nice talk. Thanks. Um. All right, I should go back to my role of uh, tech support. <laughs>